Well, hello, my name is Sherry Ann Duffy King, and I'm going to be reading the second book in my series called The Prince in a Mirror. All right. Now, um, I started this book series about 15 years ago, and I hope you really enjoy it. With, without further ado, let's get started. Chapter 20, Shreve Grove. The clouds billowed different colors as the twin suns crept to the edge of the sky. Evie walked between Aiden and Iolas. Okay, like this. Lucy walked next to Aiden, and Lucy was sitting next to Iolas. They looked like a powerful line of birds. Evie's hair wept magnificently in the golden light of the evening as the dim wind brushed its invisible fingers through her hair. The building they approached was a two-story Victorian accent. Vines clung to the white marble reaching the second-story balcony. Candlelight brushed the interior with warm strokes of golden ember and, and gave it a homely warmth that beckoned them to enter and refresh themselves. Aiden's sister, nephew, and brother-in-law fell silent to the sight of Evie, Lucy, Iolas, and Lasusing entering the establishment. You three, I need you to pay close attention, all right? Evie walked over to each of them, starting with the woman. Excuse me. Miss Mary Elizabeth Shaw, my name is Evie, known as the Escape Bride. We four need a room large enough to hold at least five people. They looked around at the others, puzzled at why she asked for an extra bed. Mary nodded, not making a peep. Evie then stepped in front of a man, the man of the establishment. Mr. Gregory Thomas Shaw, I need you to find a place in Shreve Grove large enough to hold as many town folk as possible. For a meeting. He nodded, then stepped aside for Evie to gracefully walk over to the once little William Shaw. But now the tow headed boy stood taller than Evie, with a dark depth to his juvenile eyes and hair. His skin was dark from manual labor. The fact that he recognized her and smiled deeply did not falter her speaking to him as if he were a brother or a little cousin. Thank you for helping me years ago, not only in finding Aiden's burial plot, but escaping as a child from this world into another until I was strong enough to come back and claim what is rightfully yours and our people's. William Shaw hugged her then. He was warm and smelled of sawdust and leather. William, I must also beg one more thing of you, and I hope it is not too much to ask for. He pulled back and looked into her eyes. What is it, Lady Evie Trinity Bridgewater? She smiled then. It was a long time since she heard her human English name announced to her once again. And she loved the memories that swam up through her mind to remind her, um, to remain a precious oddity. That he would remember her name. She's not talking about when Evie called her that. Or anybody else. It, it was him. You know, because they only met once. I need you to go collect as many town folk as possible for our council. William hugged her, hugged Evie again, and pulled out of their embrace in time to spot a dark shadow enter through the door. The light flickered shadows across the stranger's face, and Evie smiled to herself. Aiden took a few more steps into the dining room area, then pulled his cloak off. Shock frolicked about the room as Evie slid around, every one to exit, but stopped at the arch of the door frame to turn and glance in the happy reunion. Aiden! Alarm and excitement crossed over his family as they rushed to him in an unbelievable hug. Evie smiled to herself as she left the towering twins in, rain flickering about in a solemn harmony. She pulled her hood over her hair and covered her features. Then she reached. Then when she reached the Shreve Grove Cemetery, she smiled to when Iowa saved her from that horror of her life, a half-rotting zombie lichen of Aiden, flesh and fur rotting off of his corpse, only powered from her mythical converted blood, a rarity in and of itself. 
Evie pushed past the iron gates, climbing over a large bush of wild thorns that fell across the narrow dirt path. She carefully made sure that her blood didn't spill unless it was necessary. Lightning swim, dreamlike, across the darkened clouds. The rain slowed down as she climbed up the steep hill, winding around immense hedges and labyrinth of mossy limbs, and they are towering statues. She passed the one that she fell into, that one horrific night. Blood still etched into the deep crevices, crevices that stone-like an undesirable war wound. She continued up toward Aiden's headstone. The smell of decay rushed up her nose. Evie pushed the smell from her senses, trying not to open old gag reflexes. On the top of the hill sat Aiden's headstone, decaying with years of neglect. Evie pulled out a large dagger. The metallic edge has reflected the dreamlike lightning from above. The teeth of the blade looked hostile and bitter as Evie looked it over once more, then took it and sliced her other hand, breaking the skin in two. Her blood, her blood oozed bright lime with ebony crystals that dripped to the headstone where the drops flashed off of the surface. Tau or towing sparks of blood and rainbow streaks across the vast eternal palace of the dead. The ground shook violently as all the dead rose and conformed into an army of lions waiting commands. Evie screamed at one attempt at command. All of you fallen soulless carcasses go to Cardigan. King Ark to King Ark. Stay there and wait for my further commands, and no eating people. Take this scroll to him, and be patient, for our time will come. She screamed that out at him. I'm not going to scream that. You'll make, it'll make us go death. <laughs> With a flash of mist that frolicked fast from beneath the dead, a loud electrical burst disintegrated them, sending them to Prince King Prince Ark's front lawn. One hobbling monster stood from the rest, holding a vast scroll with golden flaky pages. Because they just made it to Cardigan, okay? It was like a thing. The one hobbled. The one hobbling monster stood from the rest, holding a vast silver scroll with golden flaky pages. Ark motioned for the carcass to bring it to him. He was ready, smiling mildly. Mildly. The scroll read as he opened it. These zombies are under your command to wait until all forces are united. Take them. You command them. With love, Princess Ariana ETBW. Evie Trinity Bridgewater Wyler. It's ETBW, but if you want to know what it stood for. Chapter 21, Infecting Courage. Evie bent over he Aiden Aiden's headstone. A quick dizziness overcame her. She lowered her eyes toward the edge. A bead of lime glowed from a piece of rose thorn. She smiled, thinking that it was funny that her crushed thorn roses still lay in complete and utter peaceful slumber as if time were irrelevant. The petals were crushed from beneath her feet, but still shone ruby red velvet. She climbed up onto her feet and stumbled down the hill, fumbling and falling over her own feet every once in a while. It seemed as if walking were an enticing trial. Sweat bubbled off of her form. She knew something was wrong, but had no clue what to think. She had never been sick a day of her long, enriched life. Evie passed the gates and continued through the rain. Her eyes blurred as she tried to find her way back to the tower in Twin Vin. Quick side note, she used a lot of power to raise that dead army. And, and teleport them. That's why she's acting funny. She's acting like she's drunk. But she, but is she? No. no she's not. It's 
continue on. The lights of the establishment back back into back to the towering twins in the lights of the establishment beckoned into the warm heavenly glow of serenity towards her. So it beckoned her. As soon as Evie stepped through the door frame of the towering twins in, raindrops speckled her hair. She pushed her cloak hood off of her head, stumbling to the floor. Iolus was the first to see her approach the building. As worried at, worry etched his heart, he ran to Evie's side to catch her in his arms as she fell. He held her warmly as, she, as he picked Evie up and carried her into the, up the stairs and into the waiting bedchambers. Iolus could hear a faint heartbeat pulsing through Evie's body. Her eyes tried to open, to hold open, but only flickered. Iolus and Evie reached the top floor where he entered the bedchamber, feeling the roar heat of the hearth, roaring heat of the hearth. He found a bed closest to the fire, unwrapping Evie's wet clothes and dropping the sobbing mess to the floor until he found the only piece of dry clothing on her, a long silk black night shift with lace fringes that opened to a thin collarbone and warm soft cleavage. Yes, we talk about cleavage a lot. A lot. Good, let's continue on. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Evie, are you feeling well? Evie mumbles incoherently as Iolus touched her forehead. Beads of sweat and rain pushed down her skin. Lucinda! He hollered deep. Lucy skipped steps to reach the top floor, rushing to Evie's side. What is wrong with her, witch? Lucy held her breath and thought, taking Evie's hands in hers, feeling the chill of Evie's bones pushing to the surface of her skin. Lucinda knew Iolus was panicked and didn't hold his blundering words against him. Lucy placed Evie's hands down, then pushed her own palms together over Evie's body, rubbing them together. Sparks flew out. As she braced her hands above Evie, releasing them, then dropping them onto Evie's chest, electricity sent seizuric impulses through Evie's body. Lucinda, what are you doing? Lucinda rushed or Iolus rushed to push Lucy off of Evie. Lucy raised her hand to knock Iolus back with a wave of energy to where he landed on a table and wall. Calm yourself, you beast. She needs a recharge. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm imagining being there. It was. It's great in my head. <laughs> Silence only rang in dead upon the ears and hearts of those occupants. Hope almost lost, for only at first no one understood where the humming was coming from. But nor did they care. The unnoticeable sound continued to purr throughout the cracks of the empty silence. Hope faltered and destitute failed. All seemed lost again. But when all, all was deep and unattainable and with one last shock of unresolved pain, Evie leapt to a sitting position, her eyes overcast with worry. Oh my god, Evie, you're all right. No one knew Aiden was even in the room until he burst through the door, holding her deeply. Evie loved Aiden, but now she was torn between him and Iolas. Of course she was aware that it was a steep, inevitable cost, yet felt just as shameful for her past actions. Her breathing came in deep waves. She was exhausted. Evie would have long ago relished the serenity of Aiden's warm muscles encircling her, but now she was more unsure of how she felt at the moment. Aiden was the good parts of Iolus. When Iolus murdered Aiden, Iolus was whole again, and Aiden was put in a mirror realm, a manifestation of himself, an unforeseen growth. But Evie loved him no less than Iolus. Evie smiled, trying to hide her discomfort of the whole situation. Her sorrow melted as she wiped her face of emotions. Thank you for the jump start, Lucinda. Evie looked over everyone's faces. And then, and for the concern, it took more power than I had foreseen to raise the dead and sent them to Cardigan. Evie gazed at 
at each of them again, scanning all surrounding her. Meeting eye contact, a devilish, devious grin slid across her face and held. She stood and wobbled to the doorframe where she leaned against the wood and glanced a wry smile over her shoulder into the cozy room, where she stumbled through the hall and, cra and crept down the stairs. Mary Elizabeth Shaw, I need clothes, please. Gregory Thomas Shaw and William Shaw, she yells. Mary was the first to bring her a whole new wardrobe, covering her black silk and lace night shift. The clothes was cool and sent jittering shivers across Evie's skin. Evie touched the robin egg blue and white dress, caressing the dainty white pearls. She felt mesmerized. Where did you get this, dearest Mary? Mary opened her mouth for the first time in years, clearing her throat. Tis the mythical Lorelei's my ancestors. She she gave it to my ancestors. She gave it to my ancestors for helping her escape death. Evie rubbed the material lovingly against her cheek, remembering the way it once danced gracefully, gracefully against her curves. Then she covered her form with the exotic material, almost felt whole once again. Where is Gregory and William? As Evie was about to finish her sentence, both Gregory and William burst into the room, laughing at some private inside joke. Then they saw Evie standing as still as a stone waiting for them. Lady, tis done. The council will be held in our old barn, and all of the townsfolk are stirring. To The meeting it will start at dawn. Evie smiled even brighter. Thank you, Gregory and William. They left abruptly in order to collect logs for the guests. Evie turned back to Mary, her face in complete solitude. Dearest Mary, where do you suppose they, as in your ancestors, hid Lorelei? I don't know, Your Majesty. I suppose on Eldor, under the shelves of Nori, treacherous caverns guarded by the mythical yet mystical yet mythical powers. Evie stretched the soft material at the bottom of her gown, caressing it while remembering small bits from that other life. Oh. She looked up from the gown, and Mary was gone. Shivers crossed the river of skin between Evie's shoulder blades. Pots and pans sung from the kitchen in the hallway where Evie was standing. A closed door um, seethed smoke, the best kind, though. Evie's nose perked up as she leaned against the door, sniffing, always searching. It must have been a day or two since she last ate. Her stomach growled ferociously, fighting for enough attention to be fed. Bread, freshly baking, along with some kind of animal meat and, and oatmeal, all steaming hot. The door slid open, and to Evie's alarm, a small girl with deep golden ringlets was stri stricken from the side of Evie, sight of Evie. Evie was also alarmed in the, at the quizzical fashion. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know what has gotten into me. The girl stood, lowered her eyes down, then up to take in all of Evie, then crinkled her nose. I see you are still in the hallway. You do realize that we have tables for the desperate type. Evie was bas baffled by the adult sound of this young girl. Marley Shaw! The girl looked back at her mother, Mary, her face full of embarrassment for getting caught being rude to guests. I'm sorry, Mama. Marley tossed in a little girl's voice. Evie didn't know what to think about over it, like... It's all right. I was lost and the smell of food was is sensationally intoxicating. Lucinda came to, to Evie and led her out to the breakfast table. When she sat down, she found that she was sandwiched in between Aiden and Iolas, each smiling in secrecy. Evie's mind was boggled. 
She sat with heat pushing against her form from opposing sides. Evie stretched her arms out and sat them on top of her lap, waiting anxiously in perplexed fashion. She yawned. <sighs> Coincidence. I think not, because I yawned too. Each aisle with an in glanced at her. Boy, was she in over her head. She looked at each of them, then focused her attention on her lap. Something odd happened. She was at a loss for explanations. First, Aiden reached for her hand. She glanced up into his hooded eyes, passion over cast seeping into her heart. Then Ayala's grasped her other hand, his eyes blazing with icy fire. Oh, how she loved each of them equally, torn into pieces over why they couldn't just be one great man, whole and complete. She thought, once they were yin and yang, a unconsciously split in two for Reed's gain. How else would her prince follow and keep her safe? With a clatter, Evie yanked her hands back to her lap and shot a surprising glance up to the source of the clatter. Mary Elizabeth was pu pushing more trays of food onto the tabletop, while her six-year-old daughter, Marley, was setting out eating utensils and goblets for everyone. Everyone was in such a hurry that Evie forgot to register everything. Dawn was creeping to break through the morning sky. Two horizons of fire spilled some glorious light across Shreve Grove. Evie pushed her hand to block out the first flush of warm light that erupted passionately across her languid form. From the huge double doors of the immense rusty colored barn on the small mound of the hill, Evie watched townsfolk travel up to where she needed to, them to be. Evie brushed away the night from her eyes and came to the entrance, yawning. She yawns a lot. She's making me yawn. It's like contagious, like a smile. Whew. Later, Evie walked into onto a small but definite platform. Her hands extended to calm down the chatter. From where she was, the very sight of the crowd and wood beams knocked her silent for a moment. The sun threw beams of light across the room from cracks in the foundational walls and high, strong ceiling. The smell of saddle leather, animal fur, hay, and wood, along with a wind of spring air, fluttered around the barn. Evie cleared her throat once more, gathered courage, and waiting for the silence among Aiden's town folk. The barn creaked and quabbled, then Evie raised her hands even higher, waiting for the silence so that Gregory Thomas Shaw could speak for a second. <laughs> Making my throat dry. Calm down, my friends. We have news that we would like to share while gathering friends for what we must ask of you. Whispers halt. Dozens upon dozens of sleepy villagers focused their attention on Evie. <laughs> My name is Evie. My coming was foretold in a wide array of prophecies. The crowd looked around in disbelief. As you may have guessed, the time for a riot, rebellion, and war is upon us. And we are here to claim what was taken from us. And we are here to claim what was definitely... Was taken from us. I emphasize that twice. Syrah is a fi false idol, one who must be knocked from his pedestal. I'm here to right the wrongs. Evie pulled out her sword, thrusting it violently above the crowd, watching the light glint and purr off of the slick blade. She twisted it, then placed it back in the holster. <laughs> "'Tis no game. I'm here to fight for our world, for your peace, freedom, and prosperity. But I need your help. We shall stand together as one, protecting the here and now and future for our children." Applause erupted. For a split second, Evie was dumbfounded. She smiled triumphantly over the crowd when her senses came to her. "'What say you, mistress? How do we gather information on where and when we prepare for war?' Evie couldn't distinguish who said that in the crowd. Only that it was a man's. 
I say I will come I will come and gather men soon. We are still working on getting everyone in Eldor and Bala. I'm sorry, my kid came in and was talking to me. I got sidetracked. I will read from where I last um, remember or recap, okay? Evie couldn't distinguish who said that in the crowd, only that it was a man's voice. I say I will come and gather men soon. We are still working on getting everyone in Eldor and in Bala, but do not lose hope. Gather fellow friends across the human nations on Eldor and in Bala, and then I will send word back to the towering Twins Inn. The meeting ended quickly. Evie walked he ahead of the crowd, meaning to stop at the entrance of the barn. One door was cracked and locked, or one, one was uh, closed and locked while the other was creaked open. Each person greeted her, and she politely shook each and everyone's hand. The suns were dipping over some mountains. The barn was almost completely empty as an airy silence dip, dripped heavily around Evie. The last of the group was a man who still had quite a bit of youth. His hair was cropped black and his skin evenly dark, with, golden, with a golden glow that gave him light from within. His hands brushed over Evie's and they held. A shiver of untold fear knocked hairs up her arms and her heart leapt, trying to flee from its gilded cage. Something was truly wrong. The man smiled and pushed Evie into a, er, smiled and pulled Evie into a strong embrace. It was absolutely alarming. She stood trying to gain some ground on how to handle the situation. Maybe she was expected to have stalking admirers. Either way, she was trying to be calm and collected. Around Evie stood Iolas, Aiden, Lucy, Lasus, and Gregory, William, all brandishing lethal swords. Out of the corner of Evie's eyes stood Mary with Marley hugging her in alarm. No one expected this, least of all Evie. She prayed for a way out of this tangle of arms. A voice rang alarm through her curves. The sound of his voice was the same as the one she couldn't find before during the meeting. It's a great mission you're doing for us, mistress. Thank you. She couldn't believe what she was saying to the man. Evie tried to pull out of and away, but he held her tighter. Evie's alarm heightened. Aiden spouts out, If you do not let her go, we will run you through. And as Iolas finishes his, the sentence lazily, And what a shame that would be. The man pulls away from Evie, uh, his eyes dark and midnight almond. They turn to flames as Evie was taken back by the hostility in his face and the tenseness throughout his body. Something about those eyes disturbed and intrigued Evie. The man looked down at Evie, pulling her in for a smothering kiss. Her eyes widen. The man lets go, and Evie finds egotistical familiarity in him. Sickness overpowers her. Powers her. He bursts into flying bats and disappears into the clearing as Evie falls to the floor. Marley speaks cynically over the silence as the flapping wings disappear into the clearing. I didn't think I didn't think people would be that cuckoo to attack you. Evie was in shock. I I need air. I need to collect myself. Evie was helped up by both Iolas and Aiden. Hostility flashing over her head between both of them. Please stop that. They both averted their eyes as Evie got up and headed for the door. Both Iolas and Aiden were following as Evie turned. Alone, please. Then Evie sprinted out of the barn toward the woods. After walking for a while, she helped to run. She happened to run into to a small pond. Two signs connected by a tiny chain read, Tree of Time, T-Y-M-E, and Levo, 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 I can't even say my own word, blah, 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 blah. Levo, Vogon Pond, that's spelled L-E-E-V-O-I-G-A-H-N, Pond, it's on my map, <laughs> of Mbala, let's continue. The evening, evening air was calming, almost hypnotizingly full of peace. Evie sat next to the pond, leaning up against the tree, 
at the edge of the bank. Legs of, of the root hopped from up, up from the ground and rested like webs in the water. She watched the suns set, feeling a calm paranoia that she never experienced before. Why was that man so grabby? He seemed so familiar, and turning into bats, even the idea seemed, to pre seemed preposterous. But she was a water serpent by royal birth, not, to, not a land lurker. So it was hard to believe, but she ex ex accepted, you know? Images of the man flooded her thoughts, the smell of his skin, the fill of his arms around her. Her mind was trying to piece together the ironic coincidences. Memories of earlier encounters flooded her senses. My son stole my Pepsi. <laughs> so I had to get me another one. Evie gazed lovingly at the water. The fans of light flooded through empty wood. Over the pond, waves once more, at, um, before disappearing behind the tips of the Aglia Mountains in the west, everything darkened to gray for a few minutes, awaiting the luminous light of her home, Eldor. Clouds spread across the still-lit sky, turning to warm shades of night. A face appeared in the water. It was blurry at first, then it cleared. Evie gasped and turned away from the water to the man who loomed with shades of light pressing off of his face from the previous sun's set. You didn't think I would find about, out about you. A rebellion? For what? What do you have to prove, Evie, that resisting me is going to make this plane a better living home? Evie gasped but tried not to run from the be this beast. She waited for him to finish what he was saying. Your rebellion is wrong. You know you belong to me. We are one and the same, Evie. Don't let my brother fool you. You are mine no matter how many times we have to live our fate. We are meant to fulfill our destiny, and you shouldn't resist me or my motives. My passionate strumpet. Evie was a, at a loss for words. Her mind was working so fast that it had not registered everything yet. Her mouth fell in a silent, surpri a surprised expression, <laughs> which she tried to hide by covering her mouth. Akmalutra rushed her, grabbing her hands with his, holding it inches from her lips. She went to push her other hand up, trying to push him off, but she was too slow. He had grasped her wrist, holding her. Their bodies seemed to melt together, inches from each other. Akhmutra spoke, but Evie could only smell that aroma from his skin, the same from the masquerade and the unusual man from the barn meeting. Evie, I know what you have planned. I've been tailing you for some time now. Your death sent psychosis burning through my veins. The only thing to quench my hunger and thirst for your flesh were poor substitutes. I yearned you for so long, then... That when the soil beneath our feet danced, I knew you had to be back. And oh, how the smell of you is making me fight to hold my composure. Even your flesh between my fingers is filling me full of passion. I've called you back once. What makes you think I can't call you again and hold you for my own? You are rightfully mine. Akamalutra's eyes were intense and dark. Flashes of shadows danced across his skin as the light was creeping away. His smell was intoxicating. Evie wanted to pull away, but she was still at a loss for words. Come with me now, and I'll spare them all. You can never beat me. Evie shot him an angry glare, only it's full of flaring neon colors. How dare he insult her intelligence? She was strong, and she would stick to her previous engagement. Let go of me, Akhmalutra. Her words stunned him for a moment. He tossed her violently down on the ground. <laughs> I warned you. With a flare of fire that burst from his open palms, Akamuja rolled a fire into a ball of concentrated light, holding it as if it was something that he did all the time for leisure. <laughs> you will see what happens when you spit in my face and conjure up a war. 
He smiled devilishly, then threw the ball. Yeah, that's more cooler in my head. <laughs> he threw the ball into the air where the wind caught it and pushed it east through Amphia Wood toward the tower in Twins Inn. Evie gasped. <gasps> Why would you do that? He leaned low, his face close to hers. Because I warned you, Evie. One last chance or all the humans bleed by fire. Fire burned inside her body, shivering electricity that danced on her pores. I will never come with you. Akmalutra Akum pushed Evie into the dirt, tugging at her dress. White Pearl shook violently as Evie turned and tried to crawl away, but Akmalutra was too strong. Evie thought there must be some way to outsmart him. Akmalutra clutched her shoulders, pulling her to face him, with claws extended, putting cuts in her dress, and slits of blood slid off of her skin. Akmalutra pushed himself onto Evie, pressing her deep into the ground. His claws receded to roaming fingers. Evie pushed her hands up to grasp the tree to pull herself away. Akmalutra saw her trying to escape. With one swoop of his strength, he latched onto her wrist, wrapping his fingers into hers, pressing his lips into hers. Evie couldn't breathe, let alone think. This was a dire emergency. But then again, everything since the beginning had been tragic, non-stop emergency. Help, she thought over and over again, screaming in her head. Dun, 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 dun. I gotta wait for the next chapter. Here we go. You ready? Chapter 22, The Darkest Side of Chaos. <laughs> Lucinda was the first to feel the heat leaving Amthea Wood from the west and watch it slam mercifully into the towering Twins Inn. No need to panic. She steps in front of a two-story European townhouse. She brushed her palms together, ready, readying her stance. With a smooth movement, she pushed her hands in a pressed-together circle and blew harshly through the inky black specks of dust that pushed into a stretched-out cloud. Instantly, the dust killed the oxygen flow to the blazing ball of fire that would have disintegrated the establishment. Whew. But she underestimated what would happen if the oxygen had been wiped out. The once flaming ball exploded a tsunami of chaos that ripped through the building inch by inch. Lucinda stood stunned as flames held high above the roof. A distant muffled screaming kept her ears alert. But she couldn't move. Someone with flowing white hair rushed her rushed up to her and shook her violently, trying to trying to do something, although she couldn't focus on what. The person stopped shaking her and drug her to the edge of the woods and left her there. She watched the figure running toward the chaos. What was she doing? She couldn't move or think. How was she supposed to help? The flames burned on, blurring out around her. She tried to push herself out of the protection of the woods to help, but her drugs of adrenaline overpowered her with a wave of sickening delirium. Her feet felt weak and her body went limp. Now her head was swimming as she stumbled back into her white eyes, pressing into her scalp. The heat from the blazing inferno raged on along with a torment of screams. Suddenly the heat started to recede from her skin, and she felt that she was being carried off. But she couldn't think clearly. Then she went limp, her eyes closing off all her other senses. Ooh, Lucinda tried to stop that ball of fire. It didn't work. And it messed her up. Messed her up bad. There was a lot of power she used. Here we go. Chapter 23, Brisk Darkness. Evie kept screaming and fending off Akamalutra. She did the one thing he would never have expected that caught him off guard. She pushed herself up into his face and met his sadistic lips. The kiss sent unwanting, reputable shivers up and down her spine. <laughs> Akamalutra took the continual kiss as a re res resignation of her rebellion. A token of her affections that he had suddenly won. He brought down his hands to release her wrist. One palm he wrapped around her waist, holding her gently. The other he touched beneath her chin, 
pressing her skin between his fingers. He seemed pleased by his delusional accomplishments. Evie slid her hands down Akamucha's back, then slid them up caressingly across his finely chiseled American Indian-looking chest. Shivers crept across his skin. Evie smiled because her plan was working. She kept her eyes closed, envisioning her untold powers, letting them vamp up. She felt his eyes on her face, even though they were immersed in blackness. A few more seconds, Evie thought. Then the light of Eldora stripped the darkness away and let a luminous glow, water glow, ripple across Mbala. Smoke filled her nostrils with untold chaotic fears. She remembered the flaming ball he had created. Revulsion crawled through her stomach, but she pushed it down and then opened her eyes. Akamlucha was stunned that Evie opened her eyes as Eldora lit her up. But what got him was that her eyes were spinning out swirling sparks of neon blue and purple and lime neon green. A sign of her untold power. He had never encountered anything as beautiful as her. I love Rick Rick. I'm sorry about that. My kid interrupted again. Let's can let me continue where we left off from what I remember, alright? I'm sorry again for the interruption. Smoke filled her nostrils with untold chaotic fears. She remembered the flaming ball he had created. Revulsion crawled through her stomach. But she pushed it down, then opened her eyes. Akamalucha was stunned to stun that Evie opened her eyes as Eldor lit her up. Eldor lit her up, sorry. But what got him was that her eyes were spitting out swirling sparks of neon blue, neon purple, and neon lime green. A sign of her untold power. He had never encountered anything as beautiful as her. He kissed her nonetheless, mesmerized that he had woken her inner passion. He smiled inward with pride. <laughs> but he was taken back by the sheer power she sent through her fingers and the intensity of the pain in his torso. He held his ground, not holding her tight or painfully. He would show no fear he loved her. She was all he ever thought of, even when he was tramping around with maidens near and far, near or far. Hmm? He's a whore. That's not in there, but it's suggested. And it's correct, he's a whore. <laughs> he had children by the nameless women, but he sent them to another plane of it living. Somewhere, somewhere where no one would ever find them. He didn't want his tainted seed to become illegitimate heirs. Evie was angry that her power surge wasn't working very well for her right now. Maybe she wasn't fully healed. Those zombies were hard to transport, and with lack of sleep, she suddenly came to a realization that she wasn't strong enough. So with one huge sigh, she brought her knee up and kicked Akamalutra between the legs. Ouch. Sure, he was stunned by her move. He pulled his lips from hers in agony. When he was far enough from her face, she bought, brought up her fist and socked him square in his face. Pow! K.O. style. That no, doesn't say that. <laughs> My head, it does. Akmalucha swore in the, in the first time in his entire life that he saw stars and hearts. His brother or enemies never gave him such... So this much of a blow. <laughs> he swung off of her in shock, landing on his back. Evie crawled over him, trying to escape. He reached for her, trying to pull her back to him. Now she was on him, and he wouldn't release his grip. She sat up, a halo of Eldor light danced behind her red, unattainable hair. Doubled her fist back again and knocked him another good one. <laughs> This time, Akamutra felt blackness coming to his senses. Still, he fumbled for her, reaching for her dress. Evie crawled off of him and was trying to weasel her way from him. If she could get far enough away, then she could sprint to the towering twins inn. Akamutra grasped the bottom of her dress, pulling blindly. She felt the pull, turned her, her face to him, and kicked him in the head. He let go, and she pulled herself up and started running toward her lover's home loves home. She crawled up the side of a little hill, fingers 
clinging in huge piles of crabgrass. The trees opened up at the top to show the burning chaos of the town twins in. People were running around like chickens with their heads cut off. She was shocked and threw herself toward the crumbling establishment. William, oh William, who wasn't little William anymore, you know, was grabbing people and pulling them out. Evie saw a collection of people lying on the grass in front of the walk, work road, walk road. Coughing and wheezing dramatically. They looked like they had just escaped hell and were fighting for their existence and family. Marley was grasping her mother Mary. Lucy was holding his knees and watching earnestly. Iolas and Aiden were lying, panting wildly. A thunderous thought shot through Evie. Where was Lucy? Just as she thought that William was carrying out his father Gregory, Evie ran to him, panicking. William, where is Lucinda? He brushed his waving white hair with smudged marks out of his eyes. He had Aiden's calming blue eyes. Evie, I took her to safety first. She was right over there. He pointed to the edge of the woods. Evie flipped her head toward the spot. How did she pass Lucy without even seeing her? But Lucy wasn't there. An aching twist, an aching twisted under Evie's flesh. Evie screamed. And by sheer power that spread through her veins, the wind blew ferociously. Clouds spread like spilled milk and honey. Lightning flickered through the sky, throwing needles of power toward the clouds and slicing them open. First of all, it wasn't raining at first. She pulled the weather in. Okay, does that make sense? With her power, that's how it's raining. Plus, the rain on Imbala and Eldor is fickle. So, like... Five seconds, it's raining. Five seconds, it's sunny. You know, snow, it's... If you've read my first book, you know that it's fickle. It's a different world, so they, they go by different rules of logic. Now, let's continue. I'm sorry. I'll just restart it. Evie screamed, and by sheer power that spread through her veins, the wind blew ferociously. Clouds spread like spilled milk and honey. Lightning flickered through the sky, throwing needles of power toward the clouds and slicing them open. Heavy rain fell and fell until the Towering Twins Inn was a calming burnt shell of what it once was. Smoke stains climbed the walls, and the fierce the fire caved to sleep, letting the rain wash away the heat. William turned Evie around and hugged her deeply, trying to comfort her. Tears streaked her face and smudged down her, his white shirt. Blotches of smoke and burnt ash clung to him. He just held her and listened to her as she let her emotions seep out. Aiden and Iola sat staring at Evie. She had never just she had never just mourned someone as much as she had with them. Or had they been blind to her tears, or was she that fantastic at hiding her emotions on certain circumstances? She cries a lot, but they don't remember because they're stupid. Very stupid. Just kidding. <laughs> they're not. They just don't remember. What are we going to do about our home, Mom? Dad? Wah! Can you guess who that is? It's Marley. Evie pulled away from William to look at Marley. Her face blotched with ash and her hair all frazzled. Evie couldn't help but look from Marley to both her stunned and petrified parents. Then she settled her eyes on William, each silent. Well, I brought the chaos and I will fix what has to be done. Evie bent low to the ground. With her right hand, she wiped away the last of her shameful tears and then scooped up dirt and ash with her open palms. She stood facing the establishment. Bits of dirt escaped the crevices of her palms. Strange tingling vibrated from her fingers and got stronger as the rain, as it rained down her arms. Then sa that same buzzing sound shifted, and then with an explosion that pushed from her chest to her fingers, the dirt and ash jumped from her grasp, soaring toward the building. But they weren't alone. Neon lime, lavender, and blue specks clung to the material as the dirt and ash landed fractions 
how the building started to rebuild from the inside of the house, from the bottom floor up and out. Everyone watched in awe, eyes wide with wonder. Evie didn't know what they expected from her, but this was definitely a surprise. Each room lit up as they were finishing up. The building was brand new looking. Evie, even the vines glistening under the light from Eldor. Ashes and chaos were hard to find of the previous establishment. Even the food that re the food was reanimated in the kitchen. Smell of cooking food seemed to cascade outside. She didn't have. Let me recap. She didn't have the power to fight off Iola or a off Malutra. Sorry, I'm getting names mixed up. Because um, she wasn't fully charged and she wasn't using a whole lot of motion. But because he took her, because Lucinda disappeared, she really loves Lucinda. That's her best friend. Like, best, best friend. I mean, they've been friends for a long, long time. And she's never been kidnapped before okay and there's so much more to lucinda's story than you know yet but let's continue excuse me chapter 24 lucinda akmalutra followed evie to the towering twins inn and he watched her fall into a tall young man's arms and then the moaning of the little girl but what amazed him was what happened next he watched what evie was capable of with dirt, tears, ash, and some specks of power, she had restored the establishment to what it was moments before it, dis it disintegrated. Even the food was cooking on the stove. He could smell it from the brush of trees only thirty feet away. No need to worry, Akhmuja turned and walked away from the scene. He knew she would fall back into his arms. She always did. Smoke still seemed to hang low in the thick of East Amphia wood. Akamucha snuck down the hill and walked into his henchmen. Four shadow seraphs crept around the body. Akamucha glided toward the bestilled body, smiling more intently. Lucinda lay open and vulnerable. He hadn't seen her for over a decade. How was it even possible that she looked the same as when I was a child? When I saw her as a child, the shadow seraphs floated uneasily. They hissed and gurgled in unison. Akamalutra was furious. Never mind, you idiots. Let's get going. The shadow seraphs moved like visible strands of smoke, all carrying her following Sir Akamalutra. Shadow seraph is, um, a shadow angel. Okay. We'll have to draw one up and you can see it. They're way cooler looking than, um, the creatures from Harry Potter that suck your soul because you're bad. <laughs>